We're, we are grateful to, to the Singapore Writers Festival for having us here as well. We, because sharing story is so important for us. As I mentioned, we went to this, this storytellers festival, and one of the storytellers at the festival said during her presentation something that I have taken into my heart. She said, how can we be strangers now that you know my story? And how can we be strangers now that we know one another's story? To know someone's story is to know them. I was here in Singapore in last time I was here in Singapore was in 1977. <laughs> Singapore was a little different in 1977. <laughs> I had come through to 18 months before, and I came as missionary for my church, and, and I had, was assigned to go to Java, and I spent 18 months in Java and then came back through here on my way home in 1977. Singapore has always held a very special place in my heart. It has been an important part of my story because when I flew out of Singapore to go home, I did not know if the girlfriend that I had left behind <laughs> was going to still be there when I got to the end of my journey. Was she? Yes, she was. <laughs> One of the great things about coming here is to share story. I will share my story with you. You will share your stories with me. And when we have shared our stories, we will not be strangers. Story is that magical thing that unites us in humanity. All of the world, according to Joseph Campbell, all of the world thinks in story. We view the world and, and the chaos in the world and, and that is around us and we take it into ourselves and we frame it as a story. It is how we have meaning. I've come here to share a story with you. Laura's come here to share a story with you and to hear your stories as well. Because we do not want to be strangers. We want to know. So, they've asked and we have brought something to read to you. Is that all right? Yes. All right. Yeah. Then we will have questions. Find out more about us then. Yes? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I must check. <laughs> and then afterwards we'll sign two books as well. That would be nice. So the written word has changed. It is now all electronic. <laughs> but it still requires glasses. <laughs> <laughs> One of the wonderful, my wife knows that I write long books, and so she says, Don't talk too long. <laughs> One of the wonderful things about the written word is that it is a collaboration between the writer and the reader. The 
writer, Laura and I, we put the words on the page. And the information that is in the book is actually very small. A, a picture that you take with your phone has a much larger file size than a complete manuscript for a 130,000 word book. That's because the actual data inside the book is very low density. What happens though, when we create the book, and we create the words and put them on the page, sometime in the future after the book is published, and you have it in your hands, that is when the magical thing happens. Because all of the sights and the sounds, all of the all of the smell, of all of the meaning and the experience that takes place in the written word happens in that white space between the words. Worlds are created in the white space in between those words. And they are created by you when you read. John Steinbeck said that there are as many books as there are readers. Because each one colors the text with their own experience. Laura says that the, the, the written word is one art form where the creator is not present for the performance. It would be a little uncomfortable if we were <laughs> standing behind you while we were reading the book and asking you, what, what do you think of that? What was that? Did you like that part? Ooh, you, there's a good part coming up. No, we <laughs> and so you, as the reader, and we as writer, we are in a collaboration. We are in the process of creating something And that's what is so wonderful about writing. That is what is so wonderful about reading, is that it requires that both of us be active participants in creation. So we are partners. Whether it's on a page or whether it's electronic. So I, I'm going to be reading tonight. I'm reading actually from this book, Eventide. This book is an interesting book in that it was originally self-published on the internet. And it was originally published as a serial on the internet, which is the way Charles Dickens used to write. <laughs> no, that part we came up with. And it was only after we published this just to our subscribers on the internet that um, a publisher said, well, maybe we could make that into a book. Okay. Let's see. So do, I, do we tell them anything else about this? You've said a lot so far. <laughs> um, in, um, in Eventide, it is about a very small town where the largest magic they have is a broken wishing well. And we go from to the different characters in the town and learn about the citizens of this little place and their hopes and their dreams and their wishes. And um, the main story is about an apprentice named Jared, who is an accountant, who wishes he could court the wishing woman who takes care of the well, of the broken wishing well. But that is not the story we will read you tonight. The story we will read you tonight is about the dwarven blacksmith. Earlier that same day in the deepening blue twilight of the early spring night, a dwarf had stood atop a crate shadows behind the Cooper's Hall, 
There, in the settling chill of night, he had gripped a windowsill with his large hands and peered quietly inside. On the other side of the slightly distorted glass, the women of Eventide gathered together in the open center space of the Cooper's Hall for the ladies' dance. Under the bright glow of a half dozen pixie lamps provided by Xander Lamplighter, and with a roaring fire in the enormous heart casting warmth and a cheerful glow over the cr crowd, a tradition as old as anyone's memory joyfully began once more. All of the eligible young women of the town pranced lightly into the cleared center of the floor, fluttering like butterflies from the streams of colorful ribbons each had tied to their wrists. Bestia Walters, Evangeline Meltalia, the Gary Cullion, the Bowley twins, and all three of the Morgan sisters, with Sabrina doing so under only the slightest of protests. All these and a dozen more from beyond the town boundaries fluttered together. Many of the younger girls joined in out of sheer exuberance, and occasionally one or two of the older ladies, usually including the widow Merriweather, had been known to take a turn or two during the dance. Aurelius Soliandrus, the gossip fairy, hovered among the spring rebel hats of the married women, watching intently but never once joining in, as she had made a point of abstaining at every ladies' dance since she came to the town. The young men were also watching intensely, though their motives were easier to guess than those of the gossip fairy. Arne Bennis, the centaur who generally kept to himself, watched with several visiting centaurs from where they stood together near the door. Bennis had managed to comb his hair and shave the occasion. There were several fillies among the visiting centaurs, but they would hold their own dance later out at the Bennis farm. Ten years before, there had been an attempt to integrate the centaur fillies, most of whom came from Butterfield, into the ladies' dance but the results had been nearly disastrous for everyone. Since that time, the centaurs were always invited to attend the ladies' dance, where they would politely decline to participate, an expected ritual much to everyone's mutual relief. <laughs> Jeff Walters, his plump cheeks flushed with a rosy glow, it being entirely a matter of speculation as to whether the color came from the heat in the hall, the meat he had downed, or just excitement at commanding the event, banged his long staff down on the floorboards of the stage he had built for the occasion. Oh yes, oh yes, he bellowed. Let the dance begin. The flag four troubadours struck up a lively reel. The young women reached out their hands and began to dance a weaving reel with three circles that intertwined as they passed one another from hand to hand, whirling in time with their ribbons fluttering about them. Outside, in the deepening cold of the night, Eulandrius Dudgeon took in every step, every turn, and every pose of the grace and beauty beyond the glass. His hobnail boots as quietly as possible, mimicking the steps atop the crate that supported him. The dwarf longed to dance. Beandrius Dutchin was a dwarf from the Eastern Mountains. That fact meant that he was an expert blacksmith. What else could he be? Everyone knows that dwarves are good only for iron work, and it would have been foolish to expect them to entertain any other profession when they were so obviously good at smithing. No one ever questioned why he had come to Eventide, what would cause him to leave the deep mountain home of his eastern dwarf, or anything about his past. They already knew everything they needed to know about him. He was a dwarf, therefore gruff, rough, and unsociable an outsider with skills the town needed, whose strange foreign ways could be politely tolerated. It was this general expectation of the eventide townsfolk that Violandrius tried to live up to. He was rough and abrupt, 
He had no talent for small talk, which in his view was the only kind of conversation in which most of the humans of the town ever engaged. There were some in the town, Farmer Bennis, chief among them, who tried to befriend the dwarf, but Eulandrius always came guarded, became guarded when anyone threatened to get to know him. The deep truth, deeper than the furthest minds of his ancestors, was that he found it too painful an expectation. He felt desperate but feared being hurt, or worse, hurting someone else. More vulnerable and fragile than anything was the tender, kind heart of Eulandrius about him, and he kept it locked safely behind his leathery skin and his iron will. So Eulandrius came up into his shop each morning, stoked the fires, tested the bellows, and began to work the metal as he had done every day since coming to the village. Each night, he banked the coals, secured the shop, and then walked down the short stairs into his home that was more underground than not. He would unlock the door with a large key and step inside, leaving the world untroubled by him until the next morning when he emerged again. Were someone to stand outside the dwarf smith's door for months on end, they would agree with the consensus of the town that there was nothing more to the dwarf than his iron working, eating, and breathing. And never once would anyone have seen him smile. Yet somehow, Jared Plum had made the dwarf made the dwarf dare, if only just a little to open the locked secrets of his heart and to allow a silk sliver of his life beyond the locked front door to come out. The boy's desperate yearning to win the heart of his young love had found an unguarded scene in the dwarf's armor. Eulandrius had been filled with a sudden desire to help the boy and had run down the stairs into his front door, pulled out his large iron key and entered his secret world. When he emerged, Eulandrius had the treasure box in his hand the genuine appreciation and admiration offered by the Ernest Jarrett as well as Aaron Bennis and that Edvard fellow touched the dwarf more deeply than he'd expected. It became a wedge of longing that opened in the dwarf the thinnest line of hope. Eulandrius had surreptitiously watched every dance that had been held at even tide since his coming sometimes from the shadows of an alley near the square, or sometimes from a rooftop where he knew he would not be seen. Spring, summer, fall, or winter, at every dance, he would be in attendance, and no one in the town was the wiser. He had watched every lady's dance at spring revels, and, through, and although the crates he used had changed every year, he always watched from some unnoticed window or hiding place, his heavily booted feet shuffling to the music. He would imagine himself in the hall, his hands reaching up above him and holding hands with the lithe human girls whose form he found artfully beautiful. He envisioned himself dancing with them, their smiles falling like impossible grace upon him their ribbons flying as he moved with them, a glorious gap-toothed smile beaming from his rapturous face. And then, each time the dance concluded, he would weep hot tears at the glass that separated them, and unnoticed and unseen, retire behind the locked door of his cellar home. But not this year. This year, he had hope. Eulandrius took in a deep breath, stepped down off the crate, and stomped around the building to enter the Cooper's Hall. I know what happens. <laughs> 
That's the good part. <laughs> That's the good part. Well, let's, if we may, I'd like to take, we'd like to take some questions. Please. We must find some, out something about our story. If you have questions. Do you have questions? No, no. You can keep on talking. Yes, perhaps if we kept talking, we could. Yes. Yes, please. Yes. You know, there are people who can be reading is a waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> reading is a waste of time. Yeah, there are, there are people who tell me like that. He says, no use, he says. So I don't listen to him. He's talking rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he is talking rubbish. I say it's something new, something wrong. I don't know. We. We, we live in, in an age yeah. when we want everything to be poured into us and we want it to be very easy. Reading is hard because it requires that we use, that we create something unique. And it is so, it is so much easier for us to sit down in front of television or a movie and have someone pour it into our head than to be an active participant in creating something. But it is, it, it is the best use of our time because when we read and create something, we create something new and unique. And it's that experience that leads us to new thought and and new invention, new new creation. It is to read is to share in a in a small way. A moment with God. Because in that moment we create. So I, I think it's a very, for me, it's a very important thing. No worries. intervention of four children. <laughs> I will tell you, I am one of those writers that when I write, I'm very absorbed in that, and the house could almost burn down around me, and I wouldn't know it. So doing that with four children was kind of dangerous. <laughs> and so I took um, a hiatus from writing for a while, and I did a lot of PTA things, um, a lot of PTA writing, and, and that was really fun. But about, <clears throat> well, 1999, Tracy came back to me and said, I want you to write with me again. Our children can now wash their own socks and make their own sandwiches. I want you to write with me. And so I looked at him and I said, no. And he said, why not? And I said, everything's going so well. Why would you want to ruin it? And the truth was we'd had several friends who were couples who wrote together who fought like cats and dogs while they were writing. And I was very really concerned that we might do the same thing. And so he said, well, you think about it. And three months he came back and I, later and asked me again and I said yes but we have to make rules and this is something every writing pair should do is to decide <coughs> how they will write together and so um, the first thing we did is instead of writing a novel we did something a little shorter we wrote a movie script 
A funny thing about that movie script is that it was actually optioned in Hollywood. So it must have looked like a movie script, much to our surprise, because that, that, that wasn't actually the original aim, it was an exercise. Um, and so we were very pleased about that. And we found that all the intervening years of working together as a family, <clears throat> sorry, I'm also having trouble with my voice, um, had resolved a lot of the um, issues, in fact, that, that um, a business relationship was a much smoother thing than the complications of everyday life. And so we found that we work together in a business way, that we relate that way really well. And so um, what we do is one of us will have the original idea. And then the other, and then we'll come and tell the other one, and we'll do something we call story weaving. <coughs> we go back and forth and make up the story, and that's really fun. And then Tracy does something he does extremely well, is he writes an outline. And he will write a battleship outline for the story that we've had. What is that? A battleship outline is something that outlines every aspect. He does every chapter. He explains what happens in the chapter. And in fact, I have used um, one of his outlines to actually write a good deal of a book because they're they're beautiful outlines. And and anyway, so um, we have the person who sits at the keyboard, which we call the, um, wordsmith. oh, sorry, the wordsmith. And then the person, My who, job. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then the person who um, looks over the story, takes care of the story, which we call the guardian, and makes sure that the integrity of the story remains intact and that we're going where we're supposed to be going. And occasionally, the wordsmith will come to the guardian and say, I have discovered a new character, or I have discovered a new place. And we have to sit down and work out to see if it actually fits into the story. And usually it does. Usually that discovery that you make while you're writing and writing process, when a character shows up on a page that you didn't know was there, is actually someone you needed. You just didn't know it yet. Anyway, and so, um, and the guardian goes through and also does a light edit. And then goes back. Then occasionally I will go to Tracy and say, uh, oh, well, she would say, a woman will not say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I say, oh, okay, and, and um, so what you going to do about it? And he says, give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives it to me, and I go away, and I write what a woman would say. <laughs> and, you and could so, do this as Wyong here. You could like this. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be fun. Um, so this is how we work together. And every writing pair writes differently. Some people do every other chapter, which I don't understand. <laughs> we think that a voice should have that a book should have one voice, and so hence the person at the keyboard. Um, but it just depends on what you want to do what you want to do, what works. what works for the writing pair. And that's my very long answer. <laughs> Did she actually answer the question? I'll guess okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. So, uh, Laura and Tracy, you guys have been you know, writing about D&D &D for a very long time. And I think I grew up with all your work from Advanced Dungeons Dragons and before that. And Thank all. you. Did you live through Ravenloft? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> You're let the it, one. Let it somebody never come back. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you find? How do you find the fault at right now? And if you could make any changes to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I <laughs> Legit question. <laughs> okay, repeat it for all of us. Okay. Um, Dungeons and Dragons. Pop ad right now. Uh, what's your take on it? And if you could make any changes to it, what would it be? New Coke? <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura's looking at me, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, she, she yeah. If she hits me, it's not domestic violence. It's <laughs> just reminding me to be polite. <laughs> um, 
First, I must tell you that I started in what now would be considered first edition Dungeons and Dragons. For, but then it didn't have a number. It just said Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. It was it my. Wasn't advanced. Well, the first one is not. The first one. <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> you want to hear that story? <laughs> yes, you do. You want to hear yes. that um, My wife got me into Dungeons and Dragons. We were just. We had only been married for a year, I think. Not even an, an entire year. <coughs> and she had a girlfriend who was in theater. And the girlfriend invited her to help with the play. So she went down to the playhouse in our town to help with the play. And when they got, when she got there, they had no intention of doing <coughs> a play. They, no. They, she said to her, her other friend, she said, did you bring the dice? Yes. OK, well, let's all get out of it. So they started playing Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> in the <this> theater. <laughs> And Laura didn't know what this was. They said, here's your character sheet. And, and here, roll these dice. And, and oh, I put monsters to sleep. Immediately after I rolled the dice, I was hooked. That was it. <laughs> she was so engrossed in the game that... I forgot to pick him up. <laughs> he rode his bicycle clear across town to find out what had happened to his bride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I go in and I said, oh, what are you doing here? And she said, oh, we've been playing this amazing game. And I said, and I knew about games. I played Risk. <laughs> I said, oh, all right. I said, what does the board look like? And she said, there's no board. I said, okay, what are the rules? Uh, they seem kind of flexible. Uh, <laughs> it sounded like the stupidest game I had ever heard. He's making it up? What? Yeah. I, oh. So for my birthday, for my birthday in November, my wife bought me what we call the Blue Basic. 